Good morning and welcome to our time of worship this morning. Isn't it close this morning? I thought I was having a hormonal attack until Peter said he was close, as, he was hot as well, so just cool down a bit. Um, there's one or two notices this morning. Firstly, I'd like to welcome Bill to our service this, this morning and hope you, your arm gets better soon. Um, the next three are about rotors. So if you, if you could kindly think about putting your name down on a rotor. The first one is the cleaning rotor. It's now up in the porch and we desperately need help for people to put their name down on the rotor and take their turn in cleaning the, in cleaning the church. So that's a big thank you from Wendy. The other thing is there's now a flower rotor back in circulation. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, oh, Glenys has done one. So as soon as that is pinned up, if you'd like to have a look at the gaps, see where you'd like to put some flowers, would you put your name down? And the other thing is um, we have got a tea and coffee rotor going on. So if you'd like to put your name on that as well, there's a lot to think about. So have a think what, what, what you'd like to do. This morning, tea and coffee is being served. Would you pick it up from the, the door by the church, by the kitchen, and then bring it out into the foyer and drink it in the foyer, please, and put your dirty cups on the trolley that's waiting. So I think that's anything else from anybody else, or is that everything? Okay, right, we'll hand over to Peter this morning. Welcome, Peter. And we look forward to your message. Those rotors coming up. Although we think, oh no. But it's wonderful to have that positivity, the joy of getting back to what we class as normal life. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And we rest assured his grace is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In our Lord's name, we are gathered together to worship him, to give him thanks and praise for all his good gifts that surround us, both in this holy church of Chasetown Methodist and in the holy place of all those on Zoom. I don't know how many there is who are on Zoom today, but I six at least, six places, so that's lovely. We're welcome and we're held together wherever we are. We God's holy people. Our hymns today focus, on, focus us on giving thanks. And if we run out of breath, and I haven't asked Margaret this, if we run out of breath singing some of them, because although there's a few of us here, it uh, still takes some singing, doesn't it? We could do with a hundred here. If we run out of breath singing some of them, we shall rely on Margaret to play the thanks to our Lord along with our hearts because we know the music and hymns unite us with God. It's our theology. The way, the truth and the life. Our opening hymn says to us in the chorus there, then thank the Lord, oh thank the Lord, for all his love. Let us sing those words of love. In the hymn, we plough the field and scatter. It's a bit wet for ploughing the field, as uh, Margaret here has just said, but we shall sing it with praise to our Lord. Thank you.
I knew you'd prove me wrong. And there we've had that wonderful hymn sang beautifully. And of course, played beautifully. And we thank God for that. So we turn to our Lord in prayer. Lord, our Heavenly Father, as we've already arrived here in your holy name, we do indeed give you great thanks. We give you thanks for all that you bestow upon us. And we pray that we may be able to share all that you allow us to have. We come before you with hope and joy and thanks and praise. We love to sing and be close to you. We do indeed thank you for bringing us here this morning in what isn't a particularly nice day weather-wise. It is hot, close, but it is good to share together. It is good to be with one another wherever we may be in this world united by a loving God holy and loving Lord Jesus lead us we pray into communion with you and each other with the full knowledge that you are our awesome God our friend our saviour who loves each one of us more than anyone could know. And as you, our Lord, care for us, may we care for each other and your world with all its life and beauty. Let us take a moment in silence to ask in confession to ask our Lord to remove anything from our hearts that we don't even know is there that does indeed stops us communing with him in that perfect way stops us loving as he wants us to love so let us in a moment's silence offer our own thoughts to him By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, we are forgiven. Anything we ask for in his name will be given. Knock and the door to the heavenly kingdom will open. Let us truly be one with God. Amen. And now Carol's going to going to read I believe Carol is that right thank you I didn't know whether what I said Carol tallied with what I've got in front of me our first reading is from Genesis and chapter 41 and verses 46 to 57. I'm reading from the New International Version. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of the Pharaoh king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and travelled throughout Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain, like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records 
because it was beyond measure. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asana, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Aphram and said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. The seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end and the seven years of famine began. Just as Joseph had said, there was famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt there was food. When all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. Then Pharaoh told all the Egyptians, go to Joseph and do what he tells you. When the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. Thank you, Carol, for bringing us God's holy words so powerfully. And I'd like to make a slight apology um, here because that is such a large and beautiful story of Joseph in the line of Jesus and the small amount that I refer to it doesn't do that beautiful reading full justice but we do all know or it's a fairly well known part of the Bible Joseph and his dreams so we'll see how that progresses as we go along thank you and so we now turn to our second hymn, 196, I know that my Redeemer lives.
again a part of that injustice I was saying I would do with that reading Carol brought to us is that Joseph is in that line of our Lord Jesus Christ that allows us to know that our Redeemer lives. We take a reading from Matthew, chapter 14, 30, 13 to 21. And again, another well-known story of Jesus feeds the 5,000. But often what we don't say, or I don't hear said, often you may, but the previous verse tells us that Jesus is sad because John, John the Baptist, has just been beheaded. And John's disciples came and took his body and buried it, it says. Then they went and told Jesus. Chapter 3, uh, verse 13 says, When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about five thousand men, besides women and children. May our Lord bless those holy words to us. May they ring within our hearts. Jesus, we know the same yesterday, today and forever. As I was walking in to church this morning, I've seen the holy symbol of the empty cross as you can see around. I did a quick count with my glasses steamed up because of the, the mask I was wearing. But at least 15 times the cross is there from the road into where we are now. You might count more. I don't think I counted what's on the colours behind me. So there's at least 15 so that says something to us, doesn't it? What Chase Down believes in that holy symbol of the empty cross, that Jesus is indeed alive and reigns with us. But that, we know, is a sacred symbol. But to those who have not yet heard, it's just a piece of wood. It's just a piece of metal on the gates. It's just a sticker on the windows. That's why we're gathered here today. So that even being here without us going out and saying anything, we are indeed allowing people to see the saving acts of God in that beautiful symbol of the empty cross. And we hope and pray that each one of us when we leave this place, are able to bring others 
into the knowledge and joy and peace of knowing the Lord. The largest cross, well it was the largest I see in front of us there, we see the stained glass window showing Jesus as the good shepherd caring for all people. Again by the symbol of the lost sheep. And many make mock Christian people, don't they, by using that story, call us sheep, followers of Jesus. We are followers of Jesus, but Jesus doesn't remove away our individuality, our own personality. We are who we are. It is just more vivid to us and we're able, I hope and pray, to deal with the difficulties of the world because we follow Jesus, because we know that he lives. And I know it's our joy, our excitement, and our challenge to bring his words to the world. But in those signs and symbols of hope and resurrection, we are reminded that life is not always easy and joyful because we know that Jesus had to go up on that cross to start with. And it can be said in this time of pandemic, COVID-19, we do not need any reminder of the, of the world's of, of the world's loss of freedom so nice to be here without our masks on, isn't it? That takes away our freedom. So many lost loved ones through that pandemic. The seriousness of the world's climate change. And we've said how close and muggy it is today. The difficulty of moving provisions around the world and the same what shortages in the way of uh, presents and goods that will be about at Christmas time. That may not be such a bad thing except for those who obviously rely upon it as their income, as their way of sustaining themselves. So that's bad. But, it, but not to actually have so, so many gifts about could focus people's minds on the real meaning of Christmas. But then in amongst all this, we have wars and murder. Life throughout the world is difficult, yet the holy symbol of the cross and the stained glass window says to us, doesn't it? That's what allows us to sing the hymns we've already sang, and those that we shall sing later. We can sing the, that praise. He lives to bless me with his love. He lives to plead with me above. He lives my hungry soul to feed. He lives to help in time of need. And so we go to our first reading and that was, as we know, long before the birth of Jesus, before the symbol of the empty cross, when the world was in need. And we take just a quick snapshot of the large and important story of Joseph and his rise to power in Egypt and his love for his family, who many years before stripped him of his technicolored coat and left him to die. We heard in the first part of that reading that he named one of his children, I can't pronounce it, Manasseh, I haven't got, yes, thank you, Carol. <laughs> and he wanted to forget his family. But as we went on through the story, he did indeed become united through God's provision. 
So here he was, left to die, and he is now the interpreter, interpreter of dreams, second in charge of Egypt under Pharaoh the king. And Pharaoh had made the mistake, for those of us who were here or heard last week, Keith told us about an important person. And Pharaoh had made the mis that mistake Keith told us about in last week's service. Pharaoh thought he was the most important person above Joseph. He had failed to understand that Joseph was doing God's work and that in God's reign, in his eyes, all are equal. Nevertheless, Joseph was in charge of saving the known world from starvation. The harvest had failed. There was starvation and suffering. It was a disaster. And a parallel in many ways to life today. People still go hungry and disaster is prevalent. Jo Joseph, as we know, saved the world from that disaster. And God's response is the same today as it was in the beginning. Rejoice and be glad in the knowledge of a loving God. Even if those in charge may yet know God, may not yet know God, the story of God's saving grace continues to be told. As we now move forward to the New Testament reading, where Jesus is an adult, but has not yet come to take up his cross. But in there as an adult, saddened by the death of his friend, of his relative, he displays to us and allows us to see how to feed the multitude and save the world, just as Joseph had done through God's grace. Jesus was doing the same, and he was showing us how to do it. Jesus takes those five barley loaves and two fish. He breaks the bread and prays for them to be blessed. And in the blessing, the multitude is fed. And 12 basketfuls of leftovers are collected up. And that blessing, Jesus is saying, as he shows us there, is not meant to be the reserve for the vicar, the minister, the pastor, or preacher. We are all allowed to call on our Lord Jesus to bless and multiply our gifts. Let us, in a moment of silence, in our mind's eye, see this plate that we used to have the pleasure of sending round the congregation to put our gifts on. But COVID has stopped us doing that but it's still important to bless the gifts that we give, the gifts that are already in the church coffers, in the bank. Let us then, in our mind's eye, see this place filled with food, with money, with prayer, for a suffering world, with whatever you would like to put on it, and ask the Lord to bless that gift, our gift, so that it may bring peace and prosperity to all and relieve suffering. So let us just take that moment and fill this plate. Lord, as each one of us has spoken to you, we beseech you to bless these gifts so that they may be used wisely here on earth to further 
the knowledge of your loving, saving grace. Father God, we ask you to bless the giver and the gift, for we know that it will indeed feed the world. Amen. So I hope we can see by turning our eyes upon Jesus and looking full in his wonderful face that the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Because in his grace our hearts become alive to be a good shepherd of his people, to speak and share the love of God in all we do and all we say. Through him we see more clearly. Through him we can feed the world. Through him we can find peace. Let us be the people who speak kindly to one another, remembering we are following the Lord Jesus. We're following his lead of being a good shepherd of his people in shining a light on God's kingdom, which surpasses all our knowledge and understanding, a miracle to celebrate and behold, the symbol of the empty cross. Amen. And so we sing, For the beauty of the earth, 333.
we turn again to our Lord in prayer and I departed accidentally from the most important prayer of, uh, I don't know if Carol put it up on the screen above you'd know. So I have to admit that I departed from it accidentally, but we'll put it in now. And if, if I forget, you can carry on. And I've just noticed another cross on, uh, on Bill's lapel there. So that's lovely. So that adds to 16 so far. So let us pray. And we'll pray with that wonderful prayer that joins all our prayers and says to us all we need bring to our Lord and Saviour, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. And so we turn to our prayers of intercession. Blessed are you, eternal God, to be praised and glorified forever. Hear us as we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Make us all one, that the world may believe. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you, that the life of Christ may be revealed in us. Strengthen all who minister in Christ's name. Give them courage to proclaim the Gospel. Inspire and lead those who hold authority in the nations of the world. Guide them and all people in the way of justice and peace. Make us alive to the needs of our community. Help us to share each other's joys and burdens. Look with kindness on our homes and families. Grant that your love may grow in our hearts. Inspire us to have compassion on all those who suffer from sickness grief or trouble. And we remember all those this week who have died. We remember all those loved ones left behind. We remember all those difficulties, all that sadness. We ask you, Lord, to be with those who have left this world in whatever way they may have gone, through natural forces, through murder, through disease, through war. We leave them in your tender care and especially ask you to be with those who were closest to them, that they still, they they will find joy and peace in the days ahead. In your presence, may they find their strength. So, Father, into your hands we commend them all. And we give you thanks for this place here in Chasetown, where we have spent many times in your presence and we thank you for all those who have led us this far on our Christian journey who now reside with you 
in your eternal glory. Bring us and all to share in your heavenly kingdom. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in your name. We pray you accept and answer our prayers, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We sing our closing hymn, 746, One More Step Along the World I Go. And our Lord calls us, just make that one step, one step each time. And we will indeed come into his heavenly kingdom. One more step along the world I go. you completely proved me wrong and we sang all the, all the way through with gusto and Margaret played along so beautifully but she's pleased she didn't have to go on her own and we thank all those on Zoom that we've heard you singing as well and that's joined us all together. May the love of God bless us and keep us. May he keep us safe now and always, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
grande.